Now let's look at Emily Dickinson's poem, The Soul Selects Her Own Society. The soul selects her own society, then shuts the door to her divine majority, present no more. Unmoved, she notes the chariots pausing at her low gate. Unmoved, an emperor be kneeling upon her mat. I've known her from an ample nation. Choose one, then close the valves of her tension, like stone. Written probably in 1862, Dickinson's "The Soul Selects Her Own Society" was first published in 1890 in Dickinson's posthumous first collection, "Poems by Emily Dickinson." Critics said that Dickinson wrote more than 300 poems in the year 1862, and that this poem can be read as a description of her experience. The soul, perhaps a poet, freely chooses to close herself off from the outside world in order to pursue the solitary, interior life of creativity and self-discovery. The soul selects her own society, then shuts the door. Here, on one level, the opening line means that she decides what company she will keep, and which social rules she will obey. On a deeper level, it might mean that she chooses the company of her own self over the company of others. Once this selection is done. She shuts the door, or closes herself off. The speaker describes the soul shutting a door, an image of the individual deliberately closing herself away to pursue some greater purpose. To her divine majority, present no more. Dickinson's use of dashes in these two lines. Gives rise to different possible explanations. First, the two dashes in these two lines might mean that the soul is shutting her divine majority inside with her, behind the closed door. In this sense, divine majority might represent her own holy or sacred self, which is now no longer present. To those outside of her closed door. Second, these lines might also mean that she is shutting her divine majority out of her inner world. In this sense, divine majority could mean the social or religious system to which she is no longer present. Unmoved, she notes the chariots pausing at her low gate. Unmoved, an emperor be kneeling upon her mat. In this stanza, we see how thoroughly the soul has turned away from all the proper customs of the society. She does not pay any attention to the chariots of the wealthy men or potential suitors at her gate. She is even indifferent to royalty. The emperor falls on her knees before her door. But she will not let him enter. This is very unusual, because a common individual must submit to an emperor. What is implied in this unusual image is that the soul state of being is intensely personal, private, and even unreachable. I've known her from an ample nation. Choose one, then. Close the valves of her tension, like stone. Here in this last stanza, we see the first person speaker's comment on the power and determination of the soul. The eye just chooses one from among an ample nation. The one may refer to her creativity, or her art, or her private spiritual life. 
In this sense, the soul has given up the rest of the world for an internal life of reflection and self-realization. Close the valves of her attention. The image of valves, either half of a folding door, echoes back to the image of the door in the first stanza. Once the valves are firmly closed, she is free to forget all the external matters and can concentrate solely on the one thing to which she has devoted all her life. Like stone. It seems as if Emily Dickinson is saying here that the internal world of the soul is hardened against the external world of the society. She is determined, solid, permanent, completely like stone. Now here are some questions for discussion. Question number one. What are the figures of speech used in the first quatrain of this poem? How do you understand the soul in her own society? How to interpret the door metaphorically? Two, Dickinson's use of dashes gives rise to different possible explanations. How do you understand her divine majority in the first quatrain? Three, what is the state of being of the soul in this poem? How does the poet present her determination to shut the door to her outside world? 4. How do you interpret the images of the one, the valves, and the stone in the last stanza of this poem?